going to try to come up out of this place right here where I'm at because I've just been crying the whole worship because he's really good. Like, he's really good. I'm, I mean, I don't want to come out of his goodness. I just want to be able to talk, right? <clears throat> I'm going to show a real quick video of something that, uh, that, that we believe is transforming. We've done... Um, 73 different conferences that are called uh, these power and love conferences it's a training identity conference has anybody in here ever been to one did it change your life it's ridiculous right it's just hearing and doing so you got to go out you can't just come you got to go it's really cool so let me just show you real quick it's a minute long and then yeah can you show that so exciting to me all they are is identity schools and we just teach you who you are and then you just go and be who you are it's pretty amazing it's awesome well, we're doing one um, in Dallas at Christ for the Nations in a couple of weeks and then we're doing one at the call out there for the call who here is going to the call all right you are called to go to the call all right Yeah, look, it's my brother. <laughs> Seriously, we got the same last name and everything. It's awesome. Okay, let's be serious now. <laughs> oh. You know what? I, I have a. God has, He's just increased favor in my life without me asking for it and uh, I'm, I want to I want to talk about that a little bit because my when I come up like even right now like every time every time I, I speak every time I get a microphone it doesn't matter where I'm at my heart trembles because I want to because I want to share his heart you know I, I, if you could say anything at a conference you could preach out of anywhere and you could open the book and God will speak to you but what's he saying? What's he doing? What's, what's he saying right now? And I, I just have had the great privilege of, of knowing him, but the greater privilege of being known by him. <clears throat> That's my favorite thing ever, is being known by my father. Like he knows about every one of you. But there's a place of coming in to the love of God to where you're known by him. It's just different. You know, Jesus, he, he was known by the Father. You know, he, of course, I mean, he was Jesus, right? But there was a place to where Jesus, he poured out every day, all the time. But he, he went and he spent time with the Father. And so my greatest joy is being known by Him and spending time with Him and being in love with God. I'm sorry, I'm really messed up right now. I'm so overwhelmed at the privilege of Christianity 
and it gets clearer every day. I have a deeper relationship with him today than I did yesterday. And when I got set free, I really did get set free. But, but it was more than that. I got free from me so that he could fill me with him. Like it's a constant place of filling. It's a constant place of getting to grow in the love of the Father. To be filled with the love of God that's in Christ Jesus is, is to be filled with the fullness. It's the fullness of God. To know the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. He wants to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. He wants to diffuse the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere we go. He wants to reveal the manifold wisdom of God to the powers and principalities by the church. He wants to reveal His manifold wisdom through us, the church, to the powers and principalities every second of every day, everywhere we are, whether we're sleeping, whether, whether we're asleep or awake whether we're at the grocery store or whether we are, we're at work or whether we're at a church service. He wants to reveal His goodness, His glory, His love, the revelation of the Father. And Jesus came to reveal the Father. And so we need, we, we need, we say reset. I just, I think that's awesome. I, I personally, in my life, I believe every day is reset. Like I, when I wake up, like his mercies are new every day. That's not a theory. Like I wake up and the Holy Spirit is there. He's, he's there. He's like, hey, good morning. It's not like he was waiting for me to wake up like he went away. No, he's just, he's there. He's present. It's his presence. It's Christ in me. Christ is in me. He'll never go out of me and leave me. Christ in me. Christ in you. The hope of glory. It's the revelation. It's the spirit. It's the spirit of adoption. That song, I'm no longer a slave to fear, is so powerful. The first time you heard it, it gripped your heart. Because the reality of it is, is it says, I am no longer a slave of fear. I am. I am no longer a slave of fear because I am. You're not a slave of fear because you are. Are what? Are a child of God. Am a child of God. It's not just the second that you come to Jesus. It's a lifelong relationship journey of learning from Him. When you say yes to God, it's amazing. You come to Him, He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down and weighed down by life come to me and I will give you rest so it's a free gift he gives us rest and so all of a sudden we're like yes this is awesome but that's not where it stops but it's unfortunate that for a lot of people that's where it stops it ends there and then we're trying to go to another conference to get to the very first place to where he gave us rest that's not the gospel returning to your first love is something that we say but we never had to leave it to begin with. Listen very carefully, because I'm going to share my heart on some pretty intense stuff and hopefully be happy about it. <laughs> because my heart, my heart, I know, I know we can finish well. I know we can run hard. I know we can run strong. I know. I don't need to be filled up. I'm constantly being filled. It doesn't end. His, he's a fountain. He's inside of me as a fountain. He is constantly bubbling forth. He never runs dry. He doesn't stop flowing. He doesn't stop like bubbling up. It's not a me praying for people and all of a sudden I'm drained. You cannot drain me because you did not fill me. I, I, I don't, I, I'm telling you, this thing is not in your Bible. This whole like being drained and having to be refilled. No, 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 it's not. The, the fact is, is that when you're in relationship, it never ever runs out. Burnout is illegal in the kingdom. It's not about ministry, it's about Jesus. It's not about, it's not about that, it's about Him. And Jesus never burned out. 
because he was filled with the same thing that we're filled with and he's not a thing sorry the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us and will quicken our mortal body that doesn't just mean when we die that means when we live He'll quicken me every second of every day. He's sharp, he's quick, he's active. He cuts, divides and separates, gets the thing out, the things out that don't belong there. Unless you don't want to go into his word and read the real truth. You go in there and the Holy Spirit will sift stuff, he will shape stuff, he will judge the thoughts and intents of your heart. He'll clean house, man, and he'll keep your house clean. He'll clean your house and keep it clean. He'll actually clean your house so well that even the thought of this isn't existent because you're in love with this the thought of going outside of there and going into into sin that's so crazy for me the thought of it actually even violates my heart my conscience starts to tremble it's not an option there is no plan B like I'm in love with God there isn't things that call my name louder than his he has called me he calls me daily we have relationship, we have communion, we have this koinonia, fellowship, intimacy going on that he is so over, head over heels in love with me every day. It's, it's never ended. He said 15, but I was here 10. <laughs> I've been a Christian 11. 15 years ago, I was selling drugs. <laughs> I was dealing, selling. I was actually really bad. But then, Jesus came. Well, like, listen, do you know how many people told me, like, you can't run like this, dude? <clears throat> listen, we'll see where you are in 10 years. It's been 11. Like, we can run and not be afraid. Some of you that don't know me are freaked out by my hair right now. It's okay. You'll be all right. You're like, <laughs> I've been in love with God since the beginning. I, I don't know another thing. And to me, this is normal. I actually, like, I, I, I believe that the main part of my ministry is to bring Christians to Christ. <laughs> I'm not being mean. It's not arrogance. It's not like, well, who do you think you are? No. My heart is to bring Christians to Christ so that we can actually be who God's called us to be. My heart is to raise the standard to normal again. I'm not some freak, unless it's a Jesus freak. I'm not some special case. People told me, well, Todd, you're just, you're gifted. I mean, not everybody thinks like you. Well, we have been given a mind that I don't think we have the revelation of the mind that we've been given. God has given us the mind of Christ. That's what it says. It says that we don't understand the deep things of God, but the Holy Spirit knows the deep things of God. And who knows the deep things of man except the spirit that's in a man? It's in Corinthians. So the spirit that's from God reveals the deep things of God, the heart of God, to our spirit. And they come together in this relationship. Spirit to spirit. We've become one spirit with God. Have you ever seen the movie Avatar? Who saw it? In the movie, he took his hair and he, they took their, whatever they were, like dreads or something, and hooked it to the horse, and the horse went, boom. And they thought as one. And so with God, we think as one. Except we're not telling the horse where to go. The Holy Spirit, he co-labors co with us. It's relationship. You know, I was just, I went to the gym today. I went to Gold's Gym right over the hill and. I walked in there and I, I came, uh, we got off the plane. I said, we have to go quick to the hotel and have to get to the gym. Because you should work out. <laughs> so we went in there and I went to the desk and I said, hey man. And I saw this book there and the book, uh, someone was reading it and it had fear as the label. And I said, dude, I used to live by that my whole life, bro. He goes, Oh, wow. And he said the name of the book. I said, no, not that dude. I lived in fear. I was held bondage to it. 
but like that used to enslave me. Now I'm like a slave to right standing with God. It's totally different. It's amazing. He's like, oh. I said, dude, I said, and there was two guys behind the desk. I said, something's going on with your ankle. He goes, no, I'm good, man. But I tore my, my bicep tendon. Like he tore it like a few weeks ago. So he like can't extend his arm. I said, no way, serious, dude? Give me your elbow. So he gives me his elbow. I said, Jesus, thank you that you show him your love. God, thanks. And I said, what's going on? He goes, what's going on, man? Watch. He goes, I said, nothing. Just check it, man. Snap it out. Check it. Snap it. He's like, okay, you're freaking me out, man. I said, you know what, man? It's Jesus, bro. He lives in me. Remember that fear thing I told you about? I'm serious, dude. Like, fear fears this. I'm so serious. What if, because fear is a spirit. I told him, I said, dude, I said, it's a spirit of fear. It's fear. That's a spirit. I'm no longer a slave to the spirit of fear because I am a child of God. I've received the spirit of adoption. That spirit of fear thing is afraid of adoption. Oh, it's so good. It's about sonship. It's about the revelation of being a son. So I'm talking to this kid. He's like, okay, dude, hey, cool. All right. So we paid our thing and we went and worked out. So I'm just like having fun, working out, listening to the word in my ears because I keep the word in front of me every day, all day, all night, the word. I just have to. Why? Because it's life. It's amazing. I've listened to it a thousand times, read it a thousand times, a million times. Doesn't matter. It just keeps getting better and better and better and better and better and better. And I can't afford to be deceived and taken away by anything. I can't afford to be taken away by any wind of doctrine that comes through. I can't afford to have anything be confusing to me. I can't afford to have the will of God be up for grabs and up for sale in my life when I am commanded by the Lord to know His will. I am actually commanded to not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of my mind so that I can prove God's will, approve what is and what is not God's will. I am an ambassador of Christ. I am an ambassador of reconciliation. I am a child of God. And if I'm a child of God and I know my Father and am known by my Father, then I know what is and what is not the will of God. Period. People say, well, that's not right. No, you just don't read your Bible. It is right. We are required to know His will because we know Him. Jesus was the walking manifestation of the will of God. Everywhere He went, it was only the Father's will. Every second of every day, He only came to do the will of Him who sent Him. And I'm supposed to be an imitator of God. I'm supposed to imitate God. How could we imitate God and not know His will? That'd be crazy. Right? I, it wouldn't be a good imitator if you didn't know His will. How could you imitate something that you don't know? I know that stretches people. It stretches me every day, man. Just diving into the truth. So this guy comes up to me, and I'm, I'm working out, and he goes, hey, the guy at the front desk, he goes, dude, I'm like so freaked out right now. I go, why? He goes, cuz, like, I went over there and curled, and it's gone. I go, awesome, bro. He loves you, man. You're not even thinking about him, and he's thinking about you. How amazing is that? He's like... I just don't get it, dude. This is crazy. So I'm sharing the gospel. Kind of like show and tell. Now it's show and telling him. You got to tell him after you show it. You demonstrate and explain it. And so he's like, I just like, what's the deal? I'm like, the deal is Jesus. You grew up Catholic, right? Yeah. Whoa, dude, what's up with this? What are you, some kind of psychic? No, I'm a son. What does that mean? Like, I'm a son of God. He's my father. And I told him, you know, about Mary and how, like, she gave birth to Jesus and nobody got Mary pregnant and how that would be crazy, like, to be a woman and never get pregnant, like, by a man, but get pregnant by God. He's like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just sharing my heart with him, and he's like, this is so crazy, dude. Nuts, man. Okay. He walks away. He's totally overwhelmed. It's pretty cool. And he talks to my friend Rick that's at the gym with me, too. And He's like, yeah, man, it's just Jesus. It was cool. And so I walk over, and I see another girl that's, like, working out. She's really strong. And I, I just had a word about her shoulder. So I said, hey, you got some stuff going on with your shoulder. What's up? She goes, I don't know, man. I blanked it up and blankety-blank, blankety-blank. I'm, like, so serious. 
I said, can, I said, I know how you can get it fixed. She's like, okay. I said, can I pray for you? She goes, oh. I said, come on. What do you got to lose? She goes, okay, all right. So I prayed for her. She goes, that's blank and weird, man. She walked away. <laughs> this is normal. Because I'm in love. I'm in love with God. I'm in love. Sin becomes tasteless when you're in love. Once you've tasted and seen that God is good, why would you want to take part in something that separates you from love? You just wouldn't. I promise. It's tasting and seeing. It's actually tasting and seeing that God is good. And when you see that He's a good, good Father, and that's who He is, and then you're loved by Him, and that's who you are, and that's really it, when that's it, all that stuff that used to call your name just ends. It becomes such a stranger's voice, the one that Jesus told you and commanded you not to follow. He said, my sheep will hear and obey my voice. And the strangers, they won't follow. Why would I want to follow a stranger's voice now that I can hear His? Now that I'm hooked up to the, to the living God. He's not like, He's not a God that's, that's dumb. He's like, there's so many different gods in this world that are just not alive. They're like Nebuchadnezzar statue, dude. All pretty, but nothing there. So this kid comes over and he goes, listen, man, I need to talk to you again, man, because like I'm totally freaked out, dude. I'm like, you want another answer? He goes, yeah. I said, listen. I said, okay, so that girl over there, God spoke to me about her shoulder. He goes, no, shut up, man. I go, go over and ask her. So he goes, hey, what happened to you? She goes, that guy right there? He goes, no, really? Oh, dude. Oh my God, I got to go. I got to go. Why? It's the fear of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord. We need the fear of the Lord. We need the fear of God in our life. People tremble. The fear of God is there. I said to him, I said, dude, don't run away. Listen to me. I said, what are you running from? When you were a little boy, you believed in Jesus, and then the world took that away from you. The world never gave you Jesus. So how could the world take it away? Come on, man. It's time to come home. He said, oh. I said, look, that guy at the counter. I said, the other guy that's working with you? I said, he's the guy that had the bad ankle. You go and ask him after you pray with me. So he prayed with me and got born again. And he goes, I'm going to talk to that guy. So he walks up front to the guy at the counter and he goes, hey, dude. You got problems with your right ankle? The guy goes, yeah. He goes, no, no way. <laughs> so I went up front and talked to him, and he goes, yeah, dude, yeah, yeah. Puts his ankle right out. We pray. Jesus heals him. He goes, no way. That guy's a Christian. There's another guy that works there that his, his mom goes here, and he goes here. Like, it's, it's just like, he goes, yeah, dude. Life Center's my church, bro. And, and they're like, oh, cool. So I go, hey, what do you say we take an interview on Periscope? They're like, okay. So I sat there and we filmed like these guys talking about their encounter like. <laughs> See, this evangelism thing, we've like, we've made it complicated. Do you know the Holy Spirit's the best evangelist that there is? Can I tell you another testimony? Am I okay? <laughs> I love you guys. I went down to, uh, I did the, the Reinhardt Bunky uh, Crusade Rally for the American Crusade in Atlanta. And there was like a, a lot of youth there. A few thousand. It was amazing. But, um, yeah, so I went out to, because you go to restaurants and you go eat. And so I went to one of my favorite places, Texas Roadhouse. And I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm doing uh, Periscope commercials for them. 
I am. Where their waiters are getting wrecked. <laughs> Buffalo Wild Wings, wrecked. Gold's Gym, wrecked. Publicly, they're like, yeah, we're doing a commercial for Gold's Gym right now. And they're like, oh my God, Jesus, just oh my God. It's so good. Anyway, so I'm going into the restaurant and it's packed with people and we're going, we went up and put our name in and there was a lady that walked by me and she was a waitress. She walked out the door and I, I just heard in my heart, go after her. So I walked out the door and I said, hey, I chased her down the sidewalk. I said, hey, I said, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to give her a hug and pray over her. So that's kind of weird. Like in the natural. So I went up to her and I said, hey, she turned around, she has tears flowing down her face. So I'm like, okay. I said, you know, I said, I love Jesus with all my heart. Can I please hug you and pray for you? She goes, okay. And I'm just praying over her and I have my hands on her head and just praying over her and she's kind of leaning on my shoulder. And, God, I thank you for her. And the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says that she has dreams of being a child psychologist, but she can't afford college. So I just shared that with her. I don't think that's what she's dealing with right now. But that's a good word for her, you know. And she goes, what? Oh my God! And she, she literally, and I'm not kidding, she ran away like this. And I said, stop, stop. I said, I'm a Christian. She goes, no, you're not, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm a Christian. I said, God loves you. Listen, he did not turn his back on you. She said, yes, he did, and screamed at me. What do you do with that? Because I'm a Christian representing the God that turned his back on her. You better be hearing from your father. And God speaks to me and said that her mom died from cancer. She's blamed me and thinks I took her. I said, God did not kill your mom with cancer. She goes, oh my God! And I'm not kidding, like rage and screaming. I mean, Aah! I said, stop, stop. She goes, you're crazy, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm not crazy. I'm going to call somebody that's in the restaurant. And I'm going to tell you what just happened at the hotel before I came here. And then they're going to come tell you the same thing. And, or, and you'll know that I'm not nuts. So... We just had a major encounter in the hotel hallway before we walked out the door to go to the restaurant. Why? Because that's what a lifestyle of Christ is. It's not, looking, it's not looking to pray for somebody so I have a testimony to share. It's living a life with Jesus so I can share Him. So at the hotel room, I said to her, I said, this is what happened. I said, we were getting on the elevator to come here right now, to come to the restaurant. And I said, there was two people that were standing outside or there was a lady in the hallway standing outside the hotel room or the elevator getting ice. I said, hey. I said to her, I said, you have, there's feathers coming down. <sighs> Yay. <laughs> I said, you, I said, your aunt's really sick. I said, and she needs prayer right now. She goes, who are you? I said, I'm a Christian. She goes, okay, me too. I go, oh, good. <laughs> Can I pray for your aunt? She goes, yeah. She's really sick. I said, come on, let's pray. So we're praying for her aunt. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, God. I thank you for great grace on her aunt. I thank you that you'd heal her mental disorder right now. In Jesus' name. And here it was bipolar. She's really sick, afraid to come out of the house. And we prayed in the prayer of faith. Nails that thing. She goes, she's crying. She goes, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I said, there's a man that's in your life. I said, he has a, he has a real pain right now. Who is he? She said, it's my boyfriend. I said, okay. She goes, I said, where is he? She said, he's in the hotel room. I said, okay. I said, you need to go get him right now. I said, how about if I come down with you? She goes, no, 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 no. She goes, I have to go, I have to go get him dressed, she said. I go, all right. So it's nighttime, so they're hanging out. So she went down and, and got her boyfriend. He comes down the hallway, he's like all like, big guy. He goes, what's going on? I said, dude, I'm just gonna pray for your shoulder, that's all. He goes, okay. Like the girlfriend's like. So I laid my hands on his shoulder and just prayed for Jesus to touch him. Now he's in a situation that he shouldn't be in. But he hasn't surrendered to God. But she's a compromised Christian. She loves God but has nothing to give her boyfriend. Hear me on this. God's not mad at them. It's not about mad. 
God loves them. And if they see his love, everything changes. Are you with me? So I'm not bringing that to the table. I'm just talking to them. So I'm praying for him. So he's in a twisted place. She's in a twisted place too. They ought not be in the hotel room together. Are we okay with talking about this? Probably should be. It'd be it wouldn't be good to call that grace. So, so pray for him. He goes, what is going on? Oh my gosh, it's gone. Girlfriend goes, really? Seriously? She says, yeah. I said, can I just pray for you, man? He goes, sure. So I put my hand on his chest. I said, Father, I just thank you. In Jesus' name, God, I thank you. God speaks to my heart. He says, he lost his grandmother a few years ago. She was a God-fearing woman. He's blamed me for her death. I said, you, your grandma died. Oh, it brings me to tears because there's so many people that blame God for things he's never done. Your grandma died and you blame him for, kill, for God killing your grandma. He didn't kill it. God didn't come to steal, kill, and destroy him. He came to give life. Your grandma, God didn't take her out. She's a God-fearing woman. She's with Jesus right now, bro. He's like crying, like losing it. Like looking at his girlfriend like maybe he told me, she told me. She's bawling, losing it. I said, bro, I said, look at me. I said, it's time to give your life back to the one that you took it back from. You kidding? He goes, you're right, man. Okay. I said, it's just easy, dude. Ready? Let's pray. So guy gives his life back. Holy Spirit, right there in the hallway. Really awesome. We're like, all right, man. And they're like, they're crying. And so we get in the elevator together. And I'm like, man. And they're both trembling because their life's not in the place it should be. She's trembling. She's waiting for me to like, she's waiting for the, <laughs> that's not about that. It's about, boom, God thumps the heart, changes everything. So we're in, the, we're in the elevator and I go, you know what, man? I said, you shouldn't be afraid of marriage, bro. I said, you're not going to be like your parents. See, your parents didn't do well at this, so you think that you're going to be the same and why you've actually said this. It's just a piece of paper. He looks at me and he goes, Oh my God, bro. I go, now that you're a Christian, it'll be awesome. And the girl's losing it because she wants him to ask her. And I'm not prophesying their marriage. I'm just saying, probably be better. <laughs> right? So, so we're just having this conversation. It's like amazing. And we get off the elevator and the guy goes, dude, I, I love you, man. <laughs> I go, I, I love you too, bro. Welcome to the kingdom. He's like... Yeah. Wow. I said, your whole life just changed. He goes, yeah. I said, what are you going to do with that? He goes, right on. She goes, thank you. And they both sat in the lobby. So I tell this girl, and I said, now, the guy that's with me on this trip is inside that restaurant. I'm going to call him, and he's going to come out and tell you word for word what just happened. And I'm not going to say a word so you don't think I'm a lunatic. She goes, call him. So I called him, he comes outside, William, he comes outside and he goes, I said, hey dude, tell her what happened at the hotel. She's, she's just a mess. He tells her, she goes, oh my God, oh my God. She looks at me, she goes, you're from the Lord. <laughs> she surrenders and gives her life to Jesus, right there, complete. I mean, I'm talking like, Ridiculous transformation. Crazy. She, she goes, I just thank you for stopping me. I didn't want to live. Oh my God, oh my God. How many people are we walking by that don't want to live? How many people in here have thought they don't want to live? Come on. It's really important. It's just being compelled by love. The love of Christ compels me. That if one die, then all die. And those that live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one that gave himself for us. That's everybody. That's right before our famous, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things become new. It's right there. So we go into the restaurant. I'm almost done. This is just a great testimony. Sorry. It never ends. Every day is one. 
I get to ride on a plane tomorrow to New Zealand and so many people are gonna get wrecked, it's unreal. I'm not kidding. There's nowhere for them to go. I'm so, I'm, I'm so serious, man. Uh, it's ridiculous. I've had so many encounters on planes, it's so amazing. I go through TSA. Like, I'm going through TSA out in, out in Seattle, going through and I get searched all the time. Just, this is just recent, this is just a week ago. So I'm coming through, I go through the thing, you know, and, and, they, and uh, the guy's on the other side, hold still. I said, dude, you're going to search me anyway, man, but all you're going to find is Jesus, bro. I tell him every time. So when I said that, the lady that's searching the bags out there going through the scanner, she goes, Todd White. <laughs> I'm not kidding. She does. She stops what she's doing. Security is still going. Shuts the belt down. Comes right over around TSA. Dude searching me. I said, dude, Jesus loves you so much, bro. He's like, all right. I said, I'm serious. The longer you search me, the more Jesus you're going to get. He's like, cool, man. All right, good. So I walk over. That lady's there. Pray for me right now. <laughs> TSA. I'm so, I'm, I'm like, it's really amazing. And I pray for the people searching my bag anyway. I do. While you're searching my bag, I'm going to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way with them. God, I thank you that you love them so much and get words of knowledge and prophesy over the people in front of you. By the time they're done your bag, they're a mess. <laughs> That's normal. That's normal. That's normal. So I, so I go in and we're sitting at the table and Tom's with me, Tom Rotolo and, and William, a guy that is helping us with the ministry because we, we need help. So... He's like there, like just helping, and our waiter comes up, and I said, hey, bro, what's up? He's like, he's like, how you doing, dude? You know, because I got the dreads, and he's got a yin and yang sign on his arm, and so we got something in common. <laughs> we do. I am a son, and he doesn't know that he wants to be one. I have something that he needs. You have something that the world needs. And if you see the thing that you have, you'll give it to the world. And you'll shine in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation. And you'll walk and live a life worthy of the call. And hell will tremble when you walk in a room. And you really won't be afraid. The devil will be afraid of you. It's his love. So I said, man, I said, God loves you. And he goes, thanks, bro. And uh, he went and got our drink waters, and he comes back, and just sitting there talking to him, and gives our meal, and we're just sharing stuff. We have to talk about some things that are coming up the next day, and I said, dude, he comes back, and I go, you know what, man? God loves you so much. I don't think you're aware of that, bro. He's like, no, man, you know, that ain't for me, and I'm just like, you know, and he goes, you know, I, I, I do believe there's a higher power. I love that people say that. Because our God is the most high God. And the kingdom's not a matter of talk, but of power. 1 Corinthians 4.20. 4.20. 4.20 is time to get high in the world. But 4.20 in the kingdom, it's not a matter of talk. It's power. So he's like, yeah, dude. So I, oh, let me tell you about my higher power, bro. So I told him my testimony. He goes, oh my gosh, for real? He's leaning on the table, he goes, no way. Dude, I just got out of rehab. I said, oh man, you need my higher power, bro. <laughs> He's like, man, how do I get it? I said, give me your hand. So he gives me his hand. And I said, wait a minute, you hurt your wrist. He goes, whoa, 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 whoa. What's going on? Are you a psychic? I said, no, I'm a son. That's my dad. He's like, who's your father? I said, give me your wrist, man. So we prayed for us. He's like, whoa, whoa, that's crazy, man. What is that? I said, the Holy Spirit. Come on, there's more. Let me pray for you. So I prayed for him, and he goes, 
Oh my God. Dude, what is this? I said, it's him. He goes, I, I need whatever this is. I said, it's the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus, bro. Come on. You were younger. You believed. You walked away. Come on, man. He goes, yeah. He goes, what's going on right now? I said, bro, you, you need Jesus right now. Not religion. You need Jesus. You need a relationship with the Father. I shared my heart with him. He goes, okay, man. Okay. All right. What do I do? So we just pray. So we prayed. The Holy Spirit comes. He's like, oh my gosh. Dude, I, f I feel higher than I ever have felt. <laughs> and that's what he said. And I said, well, sit down. So he sits down. He goes, what's going on right now? I said, it's him, man. He goes, wow. I like him. <laughs> I said, I need you to do me a favor, man. I need you to call your mother right now. He goes, call my mom. I said, yeah, she's been praying for you for years, dude. He goes, she has, man. She really has. I said, call her right now, right this minute. Get your phone out. He goes, hey, mom. I'm, I'm at the table at work. <laughs> yeah, these couple guys came in and started sharing their father with me. He said, and I, I gave my life to Jesus, and I hear the mom on the phone. Ah! I said, give me the phone, dude. He gives me the phone. I said, hey, how are you today? She goes, who are you? I said, I'm a Christian. I said, I just ran into your son today. He just needed an encounter with the father. She goes, you have no idea. I said, oh, I do. I was a drug addict for 22 years. I said, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to get him to church in the morning. She's like, oh, okay, and I gave her the address. I was at Bethel, Atlanta. So, so, so she brought her son to the 11 o'clock service, and I saw him come in, and I go, oh. There was like, it was packed with people in this high school, and I said, come here, mom. So she goes, I said, yeah, come here. She comes up, and I give her a big hug, and I'm just, and God speaks to me that she's charged all of her stuff up with such debt for this young man. I said, hey guys, I said, I'll tell you the testimony afterwards. I said, but we need to take an offering for this lady right here. She goes, what? And, and this kid in the seat is, <laughs> he's, he's, he can't even hold, he's, he's losing it. And her friend, his friend is there too. They brought another girl there. So she's like, she's crying. These people came up and kept coming and hugging Tanner and his mom and they're losing it. They, they, like Tanner's never been like he's never been encountered like this this girl's never been in a church in her life she's like what's going on this is crazy God, oh God. she's sitting there I said come here girl I said God has something for you she comes up front and the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says she wants to be a veterinarian I say hey you want to work with animals don't you she goes uh -huh. I said God wants to give you the desires of your heart but first he wants to be in your heart and shared the gospel with her. She just gives her life to Jesus. And mom and Tanner and this girl are losing it. They ended up taking up like a $7,700 offering for them. To pay back credit card debt that she charged up to put her son in a rehab that he left early. At that restaurant, God spoke to me about Tanner. He said tonight would have been his last night. And that was after he got born again. After Jesus came. After the Holy Spirit filled him. He's, God, he's, I'm sitting there beside him after I talk to his mom. God says to me, tonight would have been his last drug outing. Tonight would have been his last night. And I just lost it. What a privilege to be a friend of Jesus. What an amazing privilege to be a friend of God. You know, in, in Peter, in, in 3.15, I think it's 2 Peter, uh, Maybe it's first. No, it's first. First Peter 3.15, it says, Be ready to give an account for this hope that you carry. When people ask you, what is this that you got? What is this hope that you carry? What is going on in your life? Be ready to give an account. Be ready to talk about why you have this hope in you. So my question is, where's your hope? And what's your hope in? Is your hope just to like get to heaven? Or is your hope to bring heaven to earth? And if your hope is to bring heaven to earth, then don't think there's this huge process of getting to the place where you get to do that. It's the reality of knowing Him, and everybody can know Him. 
Everybody has the privilege of knowing Him. Everybody has the privilege of knowing the Father. He's such an amazing good dad. He's so beautiful. He's so lovely. He's above and beyond anything you could ask or think. He's, he's beyond words. He's indescribable, yet describable. He's, he's love itself, yet way beyond anything that we think love is. Like 1 Corinthians 13 is amazing, but he's way beyond that. And if we would taste and see that he is good, your whole life would be wrecked. Your whole life. I want to read something to you. It was really on my heart to do this. I'm, I know I'm, I'm probably long here already. Well, yeah, but yeah. <clears throat> I want you to go with me to Jude. It's a happy book. <laughs> My goodness. Just hold with me for a second. Don't read yet. Just listen. Because <clears throat> it might be a little bit till I get there. I just want to remember when I touched that thing, that's where I was. You know, I've been, like, I, I don't know if I talked about it last time I was here. I, I just, I'm so, like, diving into to 1 Peter and 2 Peter and 2 Timothy and Jude and just these amazingly on-point stuff to keep you sharp in your heart, personally, for personal, just for personal. Because you, you can read anywhere and anything. I want to train I want to train my senses to discern between both good and evil. I want to make sure that my senses are trained. See, we don't have to remain babes and, and just drink milk. We can, we can eat meat. But we need to go into the right school of training. We need to go and be trained in righteousness. We need to be trained up in right standing with God and what it looks like. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, He said, when the Spirit comes, He's going to do three things. That's what he said. Now, a lot of things, but, but three he, he described. He said, one, he's going to convict the world of sin because they don't believe in Jesus. Two, he's going to convict the world of righteousness because he's going to go to be with the Father. That's what he said. And he said, three, of judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. That's what he said. So, when we come to Jesus, when we say yes to him, the only way that we get rest, he gives us rest, as we admit we've sinned and fallen short, dude. Like, boom. And all of a sudden, that emotional freedom, that temporary, like, I mean, that, see, we call that our first love, but I don't believe that's our first love. I believe that our first love is actually knowing him. See, there's times when people come to Jesus and they say yes to him, they get born again, and then we describe it, but it's an emotional feeling where the weight of sin is lifted off of us. But the love of God comes when sin and the desire for sin is taken out of us. I come to Jesus, and, and, and all of a sudden, like, boom, I get born again. I learn from him and realize that he wants me to find rest, I will find rest for my soul. So I come to him, weary, burdened down, weighed down by life, boom, and all of a sudden he gives me rest, and bang, I get this boom, thump in my life, sin is knocked out, it's bang, it's woo, ah, yay. But then when you leave church, life comes. Jesus says this, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened down and weighed down by life, come to me and I will give you rest. That's what he says. Now, take my yoke upon you, he says, and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly and gentle, and you will find rest for your soul. That's what he says. So see, I believe that the first love of God, see, finding out that God loves you is amazing, but you being in love with God is more amazing. And then you realizing that he's in love with you and you're in love with him and you've become one is really amazing. And then finding out that he knows you is super fantastically 
Amazing. I believe that it's not just returning back to a first love we thought about when we got born again, but it's actually stepping into the reality of the love of God to where Jesus says, he who loves me will obey my commandments. People were like, ah, oh, dude, the law. No way. Jesus made it really easy. Love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind. Well, that's cool. Yeah, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's cool. What else? That's it. Do these and you'll live. I got this. No, no, no. See, getting that is this. When I love God with all my heart, my soul, my strength, and my mind, my hand can no longer tell me to sin. When's the last time your hand said, I'm going over here to do this? Mind, leave me alone. <laughs> Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. No, he, he's telling us that relationship with him, the love of God hitting the heart, it's springing forth from your heart will cause you to never, ever, ever want to step in that thing again because you have this intimate relationship with God to where you're so ablaze with His love, knowing His love, and displaying His love that sin no longer has a voice in your life. I know it sounds crazy, like what is this? Why is this important? Well, it's really important. See, the life that I live, it's it's profuse. I'm not elevating me. I am talking about Christ in me. Me hearing stuff about waitresses and waiters and people on planes. Dude, today, like, so many people got touched. Why? Because I'm alive. Not because I have to, but because I get to. Charles, he said about doors opening up and this and that. God has put tremendous favor on my life. Tremendous favor, and I'm so thankful for it. As children of God, we get to increase in wisdom and favor, grace, favor. We get to increase in that stuff just like Jesus did in stature, both with man and God. I'm increasing in favor with God and increasing in favor with man. My heart has to be so pure. My life has to be so clean. My conscience has to remain completely clean. And I can't afford to say that my first love I need to come back to. I have to, I get to, be in love with God, fully on fire in His love, in the passionate love of God, every second of every day. And I never, ever, ever want to have to say I need to come back to my first love. I need to stay hooked up to this intimate relationship between this amazing fountain that's springing forth inside of me, Christ in me, the hope of glory, but not just for the miraculous, but for the, but for the relationship with the one that does it all. I need to stay in a place of intimacy and the reality of the love of the Father on a constant basis every second of every day. I can never, ever, ever, ever in my life tolerate willful disobedience personally the Holy Spirit has come into my life and I can say it like this he convicts me of righteousness so now I don't just it says seek for are you guys with me still hang with me this is really beautiful it's it's called like Peter like the reason why I say about Peter about studying Peter and the the whole like Peter after he got saved like, it changed everything. Like, the Peter before he got saved, lots of people told me I can really relate to that Peter. You shouldn't be able to relate to the unborn again Peter. That's bad. That's bad. Like, Peter denied Jesus. Peter, Peter's called the devil by Jesus. This is, like, not cool, right? But he said, you know what? The Holy Spirit, like, he's not in you. He will be in you. I won't leave you as orphans. So something happened. Something happened to Peter to change him into a different man. Because when you see him in the Gospels and the display of, of what he did and how he was, and then when you read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, it's ridiculous, man. It's a totally different man possessed by the kingdom. He's the one that talked about suffering. Suffering. It's been given to you the privilege both to like be reviled and persecuted for Jesus. It's amazing. It's commendable before God. Yay, it's awesome. Come on. Something happened to the disciples when they got whipped and bruised and broken and their skin was shredded and they gave each other high fives and said, Wow! Yes! 
Look at what we got going. We got work for the master. That's amazing. Dude, they got beaten for the gospel and they enjoyed it. They were like, yeah, ah, uh, come on. We just got whooped. Look at my back. I got like 25. That wasn't just like getting born again. That was getting born again, being filled with the Spirit, and growing in relationship. And they gave themselves to prayer and the Word. As a Christian, we are to, in Colossians 3, we are to, Colossians 3, 17, whatever we do, whether in word or deed, you do it as unto the Lord and not for man. Not for people. That means that your job is supposed to be an amazing place to manifest the King. That means that your home is supposed to be an amazing place to manifest the King. People say, well, you don't know about my family. You don't know that everybody's against me. So what? God is for you. Like, let that pressure against you produce the diamond. Like, this is amazing. We have an amazing privilege of being alive today. Grace is there to empower truth to become manifest in your life. Grace is there. The spirit of grace and truth came upon Jesus. That's what came through Jesus. That's what he brought to the world. So that spirit that we got, the spirit of truth, when the spirit of truth has come, he will lead you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. Don't think that your Bible is something that you're not supposed to read. Live in it. Love it. That's where the love of God grows in. In the, in, in the reality of what those verses say in there. When I look at this stuff, I'm like, Peter, who like really messed up, he said, be holy. For he is holy. Peter said that. Be holy. And we think that saying that is legalistic. No. We're in this day. We're evil is being called good and good being called evil. And people are performing miracles in the name of Jesus and living a twisted life. And we can't afford to live a twisted life or have that anywhere near us. We have to live in the reality of Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have to live and have our minds set on things above and not beneath. Don't pursue Him just for the miraculous. Pursue Him for Him. Pursue Him for knowing Him. Pursue Him for being in love with Him. The miraculous is the byproduct of sonship. When sonship hits your life, it changes everything. Everything. You know, Peter is up on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John. And they hear this voice. I mean, Peter, you know, let's build three tabernacles. And then, boom, God shuts him down and says, like, this is my son, hear him. And they heard that voice. They heard it. God honored Jesus right there. And when you read in Peter, I think it's in 2 Peter 1, he says, you know what? We heard that voice. We're not just talking about something that other people told us. We were there. We were there when we heard it. We heard it. We were there. It was amazing. Here, let me just go there. Then we'll go back to... He's all over the place. I am. But I'm on point. So it says this. I am. Because I didn't come up here thinking about what I was going to say before I did. So it has to be. <laughs> so 2 Peter 1 is so powerful. You should just read it. Like, it's amazing. You should live in it. It tells you things like, let me just read it. Okay, ready? Also, it says we've been, we've been made partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this reason, that we've been made partakers of the divine nature. For this reason. This reason. Because you are partakers. It says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Listen to this promise. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sin. Wow. He gives this list. He says, diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness love. If these things are abound, you will never be barren. You will never be unfruitful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's amazing. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and forgot that he was cleansed from his old sins. Man, when the revelation of redemption hits your heart, the revelation of redemption, all of a sudden everything that you went through and who you were is dead and done and finished. And Jesus enables you to live with a clean conscience from that point forward. And when you live with a clean conscience, you won't allow things to come in to violate it. Okay. Therefore, brethren, be even more sure, more diligent to make your call and election sure. Watch this. If you do these things, what things? Those things I just said. If you do those things, you will never stumble. What do you think that means? I'm just going to read it again. Because I've found this in my Bible. And people told me that you're always going to stumble. And you're wrong. Take it up with my father. We don't have to run and fall. We don't have to fall. Listen, when someone falls in this, they fell. They did this. They fell in adultery. They fell in this. It's not a fall. It's a gradual descent because of a conscience that wasn't made clean, wasn't kept clean. It's the lack of maintenance of a conscience. It's the lack of relationship with God. You can't afford to move in great power outside of relationship. You can't afford to move in great miracles outside of the love of the Father. It's not a fall. It's a gradual descent. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I'm just tired of the body of Christ coming up with excuses to water something down. No, we need to graduate to the simplicity of relationship. I'm not being mean. I'm calling the bride up. I'm calling the body of Christ up to the standard of holiness. We need to walk in holiness. We need to walk with a clean hands and a pure heart. We can do it. I live with me. God's inside of me. People say, well, you're not perfect. No, the Bible says, be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. It said, let sin no longer have dominion in you. Reckon yourself dead to sin and alive unto righteousness. That's what it says. God wouldn't put those scriptures in there if he didn't think that we could walk it out. He put a spirit inside of us. It's the spirit of adoption. It's the spirit of holiness. He is called the Holy Spirit. He doesn't share occupancy with sin. He despises sin. God hates sin. But when you realize the spirit that you've been given, the spirit of adoption, righteousness is revealed, then all of a sudden you start to get convicted of your righteousness and your heart trembles with even the thought of sin. Trembles. It's called the fear of the Lord. It's the beginning of wisdom. Everything is in that. It's the foundation of life. Wisdom. Wisdom cries aloud in the streets. She shouts in the streets. Are you listening? Wisdom. The spirit of wisdom and revelation shouts. Know me. God says, know me. To be known by him. Jesus says in that day, they'll say, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we heal the sick? And he says, I will say to them, away from me. I never knew you. God wants us to be known by him. This isn't a spanking body of Christ. This is a call to normal. This is a call to normal. God doesn't give me a platform so that I can make you feel good. The last thing I want to do is make you feel good and tickle your ears. I love you, so I preach the truth. You'll be persecuted for this thing. You will be persecuted for righteousness sake. It is a promise from the Father. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you for righteousness sake. For great is your reward. But don't be looking for your reward here. Don't be looking for the praise of people because righteousness doesn't go over well with the praise of people yet. Because people don't think it's possible. I live it. It's possible. I love to be on an airplane share where the store doesn't have her tremble. I don't know what's going on right now. It's him. What do I do? Give your life to him. I'm not kidding. I, I, wanna, I want this so much in my life. I want to be on a plane and the whole plane tremble. Except the pilot. <laughs> I'm really not kidding. I hear stories of of, of Smith Wigglesworth that was in prayer meetings 
and people would have to crawl out of the room because he knew his father and these were other Christians. I want this. I want this in my life. I desire the fear of the Lord more than anything. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm, I'm telling you it's available. I'm touching the tip of this thing and I'm so thankful. But you will never read about me in a newspaper. I'm in love with Jesus. I don't have twisted junk in my closet. We can live free from sin. We can live free from the longing for sin. We can live free from sin. We can live free from that thing. We don't have to live in that place. We don't have to live in this place where we sin and get away with it. No, God sees everything. He sits in the theater room, the soul of your mind. He sits in the theater room and watches everything that goes across your screen. When he sees your screen, what does he see? I'm not being mean, I'm being real. He's an amazing father and he loves us. But he doesn't want us to share partnership with the wrong God. He doesn't want us to be in relationship with the wrong God, little g, the God of this world. He wants us to be in a relationship with the Father. He's amazing. And if you just taste and see, if you taste and see that He is good, your whole life will change. Your whole life will change. I need the worship team to come up here. Can I have everybody come up? and just play. Are you still here or did you leave? <laughs> May the Lord convict. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, because I'm not done, but I, yeah. Oh, this is so good. Are you guys okay? Oh. I, I'm not okay. I'm not, my heart's trembling inside, I'm, I'm burning inside. Because I want us to be on fire, but what does your fire look like? Because I promise you, he, he wants to burn up everything that doesn't belong. He wants you to be baptized in such a flame that your life will never look the same. That there's no way for you to ever get out of it and there's nothing in you that would ever want out of it. He wants us to walk in a place of holy, holy reverence for the Father. It's not a scary place. It's amazing. I'm in love with Jesus. I remember just a few months ago at my house, my little girl, Briley, she's four. She's going to be five in a, couple, in a couple weeks. She's just a fireball, man. But she's in her room and she's screaming and it's like one in the morning and I'm like, I run and she goes, Daddy! She calls me when anything, like if she needs, because I, I want to be there. When I'm home, I'm, I'm there. When I'm not there, they call me. When I run into her room, she's crying these big crocodile tears, like huge tears. She's like losing it. And I said to her, I said, hey, what's going on? She goes, daddy, I, I, I said, what, what? Is it a nightmare? Because we're going to go to war. If it is, we're going to go to war. Because we teach her how to fight, Holy Spirit. She's got weapons, dude. I said, what's going on? She, daddy, I, I just... I gave my life to Jesus, Daddy. I'm like, oh my God, that's awesome. I, I'm not, I can't, you can't talk your kids into this thing. She goes, I, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm never going to see hell, Dad. I'm like, and I've never told her she's going to hell. Never do that. She's like, I, I, I want to bring Jesus everywhere with me, Dad. I'm like, oh God, pray for Daddy. <laughs> I'm so serious so serious now when she does something wrong like if, if she's doing something wrong she'll go dad I need to talk to you like if they're at the store and something she'll go dad like she's developing her relationship with the fear of the Lord my four-year-old dad I was at the store and and I told mommy I wanted this one thing and then mom said no and asked her again I go why she goes I don't know dad it wasn't right I go okay come on come here and I love her and we talk about the truth of what the Bible says about lust. You say, she's four. No, no, no. You train your kids in righteousness. It's not, I'm not getting a hold of her with a headlock. I'm teaching her what God is and who He is and how holy and lovely He is. Because when you've tasted and seen Him, you won't want... Look, Christmas time. Man, you, you mentioned that. Christmas for a four-year-old. It's okay if they don't... One of them. 
We got one. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. When you're a kid and Christmas comes, it's always a bummer when your last gift hits. It's like, oh man, is that all? <laughs> really? Man, with God, it never ends. It keeps on coming and keeps on coming and keeps on coming. Let me read one more thing and we're going to pray. Are you guys okay? He says, therefore, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. So an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It says, for this reason, I will, be not, I will not be diligent, oh wait a minute, I will not be negligent, sorry, to remind you always of these things, though you know, for this reason, I will be negligent, I will not be negligent, okay, sorry. I want to get to the scripture, so I'm like trying to get ahead of it. Sorry, for this reason. <laughs> I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. It says this, remember when Peter, James, and John were up on the Mount of Transfiguration and they heard this voice, and God said to, to Jesus, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. He says, for we received from God the Father honor, He received honor and glory when such a voice came to Him from excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on that holy mountain. So Peter, James, and John are the people that heard that voice. But Peter was an orphan. So he heard it, and he heard it for Jesus. But when the spirit of adoption was poured out, something changed, something shifted, which changed Peter to a different man. And it says this, so we have the prophetic word confirmed. So like, who here likes prophetic words? Okay, this would be a really good one. We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Peter was a man that was lost, that was an orphan, but Jesus chose him. Peter had an encounter with Jesus on the boat when they first met. Jesus said, throw your nets off. Peter fell to his knees and said, away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. But Jesus didn't get away from him. He's like, I want you to hang with me. So they hang with Jesus for a couple of years. And Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to Peter. And when Jesus said, I'm going away, Peter's like, no way! You're the best thing that ever happened to me. You're not going anywhere. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Your mind is full of the things of man and not the things of God. Peter's like awestruck. And then Jesus says right after that, unless a man denies himself, picks up his cross and follows me, he can't be my disciple. That's what he says. So when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, Peter was changed into a different man because the Holy Spirit that comes to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, Peter now is convicted of right standing with God, and he is convicted of being a son for the first time in his life. And he stands up and he preaches the gospel. And 3,000 people are added the first day that Holy Spirit fell. Peter was changed into a different man. And those things that were tolerated in his life before aren't tolerated anymore. Those things that used to be so easy for him to do, those things, swearing, profanity, being angry, screaming at your wife, yelling at your kids profusely, not being able to have a harness on the reality of your lips because people, some people have told you that in James 3 it says that nobody can bridle the tongue for it's unruly and full of evil. It's like really bad. It says no one can tame the tongue. My question is this, do you believe that your tongue is untamable, or do you believe that it's out of your heart your mouth speaks? Because when the spirit of sonship rises and dawns in your heart, 
where Peter, that heard Jesus, heard Jesus get this declaration from the Father. This is my son, Jesus. Hear him. He is my beloved son. He's my beloved son. That same voice Peter heard on the day of Pentecost because the Holy Spirit rested upon him, filled his heart with the spirit of adoption. And all of a sudden, the love of God was poured out profusely in his heart. But it wasn't just a one time, get born again and leave it. It was a continued life of living in the love of God and living from the place of relationship. There are people that are all over the place that are walking in the miraculous and living a gross, sinful life and a twisted life behind the closed doors. And I'm telling you that you don't have to. I'm telling you that God will flow through you regardless of where your heart's at but it's very important that your heart gets to the right place. It's very important that this thing starts off your life right here, that the spirit of sonship, the reality of the conviction of righteousness hits your soul and a fresh baptism of fire hits your life in such a place where the spirit of holiness possesses your life to where some things that were tolerated before are not tolerated anymore. This isn't legalism, this is relationship. I didn't get to Jude. I should read it because it's amazing. I, I should just touch it real quick. It's only one chapter. Sorry. Mercy, I'll just, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus and, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy peace and love be multiplied to you. You know it says grace and peace be multiplied, grace and peace be multiplied, grace and peace be multiplied. He says mercy, peace, mercy is new every morning. God wants to give us the peace of God that surpasses understanding, surpasses the knowledge, of it surpasses everything. Where you have this peace that actually trains your soul to where you find rest for your soul on a constant basis and love be multiplied unto you. That's the agape love of the Father, multiplied unto you. While I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to extend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly man who turned the grace of God, listen very carefully, who turned the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God, the Lord of our Jesus Christ. So they turn grace into a license to sin and saying God's okay with it because people say, well, God will take me just the way I am. And it's true, but grace commands and demands transformation. And transformation doesn't happen just by coming to church on Sunday or coming to a conference once in a while. You can get a real kickstart and a reset, but you need to develop the reality of the love of God, the mercy of God, the peace of God, and the grace of God in your own life through your own intimate relationship, relationship and communion with the Holy Spirit. Because I'm gonna pray, and I believe that what happens on my life and in my life is gonna happen in yours, but I'm gonna pray for a fresh baptism in the fear of the Lord upon your life to where your whole life would be a constant conviction to the world around you. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, listen to this, having saved people out of the land of Egypt afterward, destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting change under darkness for the judgment on that great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Listen, I understand. The world has nothing to do with what I'm telling you right now. I'm talking about the reality of the state of the church right now. I'm talking about things that are tolerated in the body of Christ and called normal that are not normal. Because if you read this book, it is completely abnormal. And God has a refining fire to, to completely burn and sift out this stuff before it's too late. Because one day you're going to stand before God. And you ought to stand before Him today and you ought to stand before Him now rather than wait till then. Because you will live in a constant condemnation and conviction.
Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts. In these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, having run greedily into the error of Balaam per prophet, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts, like the feasts without, they, <clears throat> while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. Without fear, only themselves. These are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of sea foaming up, their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Oh my gosh, I can hardly read it. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungo un ungodly among them for all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, for all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and with their mouth their great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which we have spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there will be mockers in the last time who will walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your holy, of most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. And on some, have compassion, making a distinction, but others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment that was defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless, God is able to keep us from stumbling. Will we submit to the God that's able to keep us from stumbling ever? To present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to God our, to our, God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. I believe that God has called me to raise the standard, but not, but not without me walking it first. I'm not boasting in me because it's in my weakness that He's strong, but it's in a place of complete submission and surrender to the Father. It's not me being tough, me being strong, me thinking I know it all. It's not. It, listen, I've read this so many times, but each time I read it, it gets deeper and deeper and sharper and more amazing, and it trembles my flesh just because there's so much stuff. Sin is sitting and waiting at your door. Sin waits at your door. Yet Jesus says to anybody who knocks, it'll be open. It's the wrong door. See, that's the door. That's this door. See, once you go into this door, that sin that's waiting at your door, it's waiting so far away because you've entered into this narrow gate, the way that leads to life. Listen, I want everybody to stand, please. I'm sorry I went long. I, listen, I, I get it. I, I'm... I... I want us to finish well. I want us to burn bright. I'm just going to ask right now, just going to worship. Yay. I just, we're just going to worship and I'm going to ask you, listen, turn the lights down please. <laughs> 